Recently, I, I've been thinking a lot about emotions. Y'all got any of those emotion thingies, anybody? Anybody? Last couple of weeks, I, I, I've been pondering and stewing a lot about these things that God gave us called emotions. And, and through all of my thinking, through all of my pondering, over the last couple of weeks, I, I think if I had to choose, I think one of the worst feelings in the world, out of all of the emotions we humans can experience, to me the worst is the feeling of disappointment. The feeling of being let down, right? That feeling of even though your hopes and your plans and your dreams are so invested in this particular outcome, the feeling of those hopes and plans not going the way you wanted them to go. Let me ask, has anyone here ever felt that before? Is he really asking if anyone besides himself has been disappointed? Is he that clueless, right? Of course you've been disappointed before. Of course you have been let down. It's a pretty universal emotion, right? That feeling of disappointment. Because frankly, even in the best of scenarios, things will never always go your way, will it? Whether it's a job that you hoped for, maybe, maybe a gift that you've been asking for, maybe it was a relationship that didn't go the way you wanted. Disappointment is something we can all expect to go through at multiple points in our lives. Now, I don't know about you guys, but when I get disappointed, especially something that I've been like super invested in, right? If I'm being real, I have this tendency to get like overwhelmed, right? I get this like pit in my stomach and everything in the world is just wrong, and it can be over the dumbest stuff too, I swear. I, I've told this story before, but when I was about 10, I wanted a bike. And not just any bike, but I wanted the granddaddy, awesomest bike that had ever biked before, a bike called the Huffy Screecher. Has anyone ever heard of that bike before? Real talk, I'm so sad because I literally can't find even a single picture of this bike anywhere. I've scoured the internet. I, I can't find any concrete evidence that this bike even existed, but I can so vividly remember the commercials for it. In the commercials, it would start with like this group of like loser kids riding their loser bikes around their loser neighborhood, right? And these, they're doing these dumb puny like little jumps off these little homemade ramps and whatnot. And these little peasant kids, they're all stoked uh, about the wimpy things that they're doing, right? They're saying stuff like, oh, you went so fast that time, Timmy, right? You got so much hang time. And then you hear someone off screen say like, you call that speed. The camera pans over and then you see it, right? The best bike in the entire world, the Huffy Screecher. This kid takes off going like Mach 5, right? There's this, gray, this trail of green energy behind him lighting the road on fire. He starts hitting these jumps and these ramps, doing like 30, 40 feet, right? Doing backflips and fishtails. It, it was just awesome. It was amazing. And from the moment I first saw this commercial, I knew one thing. I wanted that bike. That bike was the bike for me. No other bike compared to the pure awesomeness of the Huffy Screecher. It was the coolest thing 10-year-old Jeremy had seen in his entire life. Fast forward a couple months. It's my birthday, 11 years old. I open all my presents. I start getting through the pile. I start seeing the floor, and, and this feeling starts to well up in me, right? Where is it? Where is the bike? Where is my huffy Screecher, and just as I'm about to accept my fate, right, of being a loser without a huffy screecher, my dad he pipes up with this, "Oh, I, uh, I think I left one in the garage." Here, right, you know that typical funny parent move. Let's crush our kids' hopes and dreams and make them think we didn't get them the coolest thing that's ever been on God's green earth. Ha <laughs> ha! I'm so funny. Anyways, uh, he goes to the garage. He comes back, and there. It is in all of its glory. I swear, it's glowing, right? It's illuminating this green light, and it's, it's even more beautiful than it looked in the commercials, right? It was perfect. So I ditch all of my other toys, and I, I go outside, and I take this bike for a spin. And this is where the disappointment really starts to set in. I get on the bike, and I start pedaling, and something's wrong, right? Even though I was going as fast as I possibly could, there was no green energy trail behind me. 
In fact, I wasn't going any faster than I did on my other bike. There was no, no sonic boom. The people weren't coming out of their houses to see my epic display of awesomeness like in the commercial. There was no fanfare. There was no uh, tracks of fire. There was nothing. When I ran over a speed bump, I wasn't launched 30 feet in the air. What gives, right? That's not what I wanted. I wanted speed. I wanted pure, unfettered awesomeness. I wanted the greatest bike in the world, and that is not what I got. Real talk, I lost all faith in humanity that day. How do they think it was okay just to go on TV and lie about things this important, right? It wasn't fair. Real talk, I'm not ashamed. 11-year-old Jeremy cried a lot that day. And now that I'm a parent, like, man, that would just break my heart. Like, I got you this cool bike. It was like $300, and you're just going to cry over it? Little jerk, right? But I cried a lot that day because even though I had gotten what I wanted, what I wanted wasn't what I thought it would be. I thought I'd be getting this awesome bike, this pinnacle of human engineering, fastest thing on the planet, but instead I got a green bike that was no different than any other bike I'd had. I had hyped this thing so much in my mind, but when I finally got it, I wasn't what I thought it would be. Isn't that the worst? Have you ever gone through something like that? Real talk, this is why I don't pre-order video games anymore. If you pre-order video games in this day and age, you're dumb. Just throwing that out there. But that feeling of raw disappointment, it's the worst. That feeling of after hyping something up so hard in your mind, but in the end, it's nothing like you thought it would be to me. That is the absolute worst feeling in the world. This morning, we are in our third and our final week of our series, The Cycle of Pain. Everyone say that with me this morning. The Cycle of Pain. See, I got control. I got control. You know, recently, it seems like a lot of us have been going through some stuff. Many of us are going through this season of pain in our lives, this season of unease, this season of discomfort, this season of hurt. And in this series, what we've been doing is we've been diving into this ancient story in the Old Testament to look at this family who went through this vicious cycle of pain. In our first week, we looked at the life of a woman named Leah. We saw how her insecurity is what sent her into a cycle of pain and And we concluded that the way she was able to break out of this cycle, it wasn't anything she could do herself. It wasn't a method. It wasn't a 12-step program, but it was an encounter with Jesus. Last week, week two, we dove back in. We looked at at how uh, the cycle of pain that Leah's sister, Rachel, went through as as a result of her jealousy and bitterness. And just like Leah, we concluded that that the way Rachel was able to interrupt the cycle she was in, it wasn't anything she did herself. But it was when she was able to let go of her pain that God was able to interrupt it for her. And this morning, as we close out this series, we're diving back in and we're looking at the life of Leah and Rachel's husband, a guy named Jacob. And in doing so, we're going to see how things like chronic disappointment can send us into this long, drawn-out cycle of pain that can last months, years, if we let it, even a lifetime. Before we dive in, though, as always, let's, uh, let's open up to God first in prayer. Would you join me this morning, my friends? Jesus, we thank you today. God, we're just excited to be in your presence. We're excited that we get to spend these, mim- these minutes and moments together just worshiping you and learning about you and becoming more like you. And God, if we're here and maybe we're in the cycle of pain, Maybe we're in the midst of something that's just beyond our control, something that just keeps going and going and going. God, our prayer today is that you would speak to us in the midst of the pain that we might be in today. Speak to our hearts this morning. Show us that even in the midst of these vicious cycles of pain, we can still find everlasting joy and peace that surpasses all understanding. Let us learn to lean on you in the midst of these cycles. And just importantly, God, just speak to our hearts this morning. We thank you. We say these things in your name. Amen. You want to know something gross? Last week, I drank Cody's water. 
Yeah. Disgusting. I didn't figure it out till after church either. It's like, wait a minute, mine was cold. That one's still cold. That was warm. Ew. But anyways, if you're taking notes, if you're following along with us this morning, we are going to be starting. We're in the book of Genesis today, and we're going to be in verse, or sorry, chapter 25. Genesis chapter 25. And as we dive in this morning, I just want to kind of start out our talk by honestly just kind of describing the cycle of pain that Jacob is in. Because the whole time, as we've been focusing on, on the story, we've been focusing on Leah and Rachel and their personal cycles of pain, I, I think that Jacob, this whole time, he's been in his own cycle of pain. If you missed the last couple of talks, I do want to encourage you, go check them out, whether you're uh, on Facebook or YouTube. You don't have to right now. You can wait till after we're done. But, um, but unlike Rachel and Leah, whose cycles, they were fairly uh, sudden and short, right, relatively speaking. On the flip side, Jacob's cycle has been this long, drawn-out cycle of pain beginning very early in his life. So this morning, we're going to be looking at, again, disappointment. Because Jacob's cycle this morning is a cycle of disappointment. Throughout his whole life, Jacob has been repeatedly let down by the people he trusted the most. By his brother, by his father, by his uncle, by his wives, even later on by his children. His life has been this constant cycle of disappointment after disappointment after disappointment. And as a result, this long, drawn-out cycle of pain, it's molded Jacob in such a way that instead of coping and overcoming his pain, he would actually live and act out and make decisions that only serve to perpetuate and propagate the cycle. So as we dive in, I just want to take kind of a broad look at Jacob's life. And I would like to pinpoint some key moments, right? Key moments where I think we can begin to see where each stage of his cycle of pain shifts and a new one begins. And to kick it off, so jumping right in. The first stage of Jacob's cycle of pain this morning is this. Trust issues. Write that down this morning, church. Stage one for Jacob's cycle of pain. It starts when he starts losing trust in the people around him. Let's look at the story. Genesis 25, it says this in verses 24 through 28. When it came time for her to give birth, he's talking about Rebecca, um, Jacob's mom. There were twin boys in her womb. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was hair, like a hairy garment, so they named him Esau. And after this, his brother came out with a hand grasping Esau's heel, so he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. The boys grew up, and Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the open country, while Jacob was content to stay at home among the tents. I feel you, bro. Isaac, who had a taste for wild game, loved Esau, but Rebekah loved Jacob. So first off, jumping right in, to me, these verses are honestly pretty sad, if you really think about it. Because if you remember from our last two messages, you'll remember that, that when it came to names and giving names to your kids, it was a really big deal in ancient Hebrew culture. If you remember Leah, she used the names of her children as this way to kind of get attention while she was in her cycle of pain. And in the same way, Rachel, she used the names of her children as a way to kind of make herself feel better about her cycle. And all of their names, they, they meant something. It wasn't like naming someone Bob or, or, or Jake or something because that's what grandpa's name was and it didn't, you know, just sounded good on paper. No, every one of these names that they gave, they meant something. They had a deeper meaning than what was just on the surface. And we can see the same thing here um, when Rebecca named her twins. Since Esau was a Sasquatch, apparently, his name literally meant Harry, right? Now, kind of weird, but not outright bad. But for our main character this morning, Jacob's name, it means on the heel, on the heel, which if you're not familiar with uh, ancient Hebrew sayings and idioms, on the heel, it was a way of calling someone basically like a trickster, a deceiver, a con man. I don't know why Rebecca would name her son that. I don't know if she was going through something herself or not, but... Personally, I can't really imagine naming a kid something like that because they were basically what it was doing is they were saying that Jacob was going to be that person. 
That he would be a trickster, that he would be a deceiver. And the last part of these verses made me sad too, because even as a grown up, Isaac and Rebecca, they still played favorites, right? And I don't know about you, but if my dad told me he liked my brother more than me because he likes to go hunting, that would kind of hurt, I think, just a little bit, right? I don't think I would just kind of like brush that off and be like, okay, dad. I think these verses, they're important because what we can see from them is from the very start, I believe Jacob was set up for failure. I do. From the get-go, the way he was raised, the environment he grew up in, it was obviously unhealthy. It was obviously dysfunctional. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not claiming I'm the best parent in the world. I, I got to be real. I got my dysfunctions. I got my stuff. But I think the family life Jacob grew up with, it didn't do him any favors. And I think that his childhood and early adulthood in this environment, it caused him uh, enough pain over the years to where Jacob, to him, things like trust and pain, they started becoming related. They started becoming tied together. If he starts trusting someone, eventually that person will, without fail, let him down in some way, shape, or form. So as a result, we're told that he starts to put up these walls around him, right? Not letting anybody in. And I think it's so relatable because oftentimes when we're hurt by someone, we have this tendency. So first we start putting up walls, but second, we have the tendency to start blaming ourselves. Start thinking things like, man, I, I can't believe I let myself open up like that again. Or I didn't see the signs. So, man, it's my fault. Man, I, should, I need to start paying attention to these red flags a little more. We start to close ourselves off. And honestly, if I'm being real, it does work. Closing yourself off, it works. Because if you don't trust, no one's ever going to let you down, right? But what we don't realize is that it's also a two-way street, right? If we don't trust people, sure, we're not going to get hurt. But we're also closing ourselves off to some more than just that. We're closing ourselves off to being loved. We're closing ourselves off to the relationships that God intended us for. So in our story, Jacob, he starts, starts off not only a cycle of pain by developing these trust issues, but he starts his very life by with developing these issues. The most vulnerable time in his life was spent learning that trusting people only brings pain. And that mindset over time it begins to fester, it begins to grow, which leads him into the second cycle, second stage in the cycle, which is this. Fear of disappointment. Write that down this morning. The next stage in Jacob's cycle today, if I'm being really, if I'm being honest, it's actually pretty much the same as his first cycle, except it's amplified. His life has been filled with so much disappointment that he actually begins to develop this complex about it. He becomes so afraid of opening up to people, so afraid of, of disappointing uh, people disappointing him that he starts to let this fear begin to dictate how he navigates in this life. He begins to navigate life with the mindset of the only person I can count on is me. If you want something done right, you got to do it yourself. When it came to his relationships and his interactions with others, he starts to view them with the thought, how can this benefit me? How can I come out on top of this? How can I uh, leverage this situation to be good for me? And this mindset is clear in the scriptures. Let's look at what it says in verses 29 through 34. Once, when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I am famished. Jacob replied, first, sell me your birthright. Look, I'm about to die, Esau said. What good is the birthright to me? But Jacob said, swear it to me first. So he swore an oath to him, selling his birthright to Jacob. Then Jacob gave Esau some bread and some lentil stew. He ate and drank and then got up and left. So Esau despised his birthright. Now, I got I to gotta say before we continue, how hard would it have been just to give a brother some soup, right? 
And also, why would you trade your birthright for a bowl of beans, right? Like, what is even going on here? Esau, he was bigger. Why didn't he just take the soup? Who's going to stop him, this little hairless runt over here, right? But for real, when it comes to, to Jacob's cycle of pain, I think he's just entering in these verses stage two. And I may be reaching a bit, but I think this is where Jacob, he starts to really think to himself, what am I going to do, Right? I can't count on anyone to provide for my future. I don't get the birthright. I don't get the blessing. I'm I'm on my own. The only one that's going to look out for me is me. And I got to tell you, when you think you're alone for long enough, it starts to change you. It does. It starts to make you act different. Because when we're in pain, oftentimes our only goal, our only desire is to get out of pain, is to stop the pain at all costs. And when you begin to associate your pain with trusting people, you start to close yourself off. Pain comes from people after all, so in closing ourselves off, we have to start looking out for ourselves. So Jacob, he took this moment and he ran with it. It's like the, uh, the divine plopped it in his lap and he thought to himself, this is it, this is my ticket. Dad's favorite, Bigfoot over here. He's asking for something. He needs something from me. Let's see what I can get out of him. Because if I did something nice for him, he's somehow going to use that against me, right? And I think this really, it speaks to the human condition. Because I think there's a lot of people that suffer from this very mindset. How can I benefit from this? How can this better me? Because I'm not a charity, right? I can't just give away all my stuff. I need that stuff. How will it impact my future if I give away all of my soup? I need that soup for my future. And I think when we look at it like that, it shows how kind of silly and ridiculous that thought process is. Like, it's just soup, bro. Make some more. Help out your brother. But when we get into these cycles, we don't really see things for what they are. We don't see things with clarity, but we see things from our own pain-warped reality. In our story today, Jacob, he somehow came out on top. I don't know how he did it, but he did it. He came out on top. He somehow got everything that he wanted, but that didn't make his cycle end. In fact, it actually progressed him to the next stage, which is this. Total apathy. Write that down. Total apathy. Jacob's third and final stage this morning was that he started becoming apathetic to the people around him. He started not caring what happened to those close. And there's a lot of verses to back this up. For the sake of time, though, I can't go into detail about them all, but I think the best example, it comes from chapter 27. Now, it's a long, kind of drawn-out chapter, but the cliff notes are this. Isaac, Jacob's dad, right, he's getting old. And before he dies, he has one last wish. He wants Esau, his favorite son, to kill and prepare him some fresh game. And as a reward, Isaac would give Esau his blessing, his patriarchal blessing. Well, Jacob's mom, Rebecca, she overhears Isaac talking to Esau. And as a result, her and Jacob, they decide that they're going to trick Isaac into giving the blessing to Jacob instead. So Jacob, right, he runs out, he gets some fresh game, they prepare it, they dress Jacob up in Esau's clothes, they even go far as to, as to cover Jacob's arm in hair, so on the off chance that Isaac touches Jacob, he'll think he's touching a Yeti, right? And the plan, it goes off without a hitch. Isaac, he falls for their ploy. He gives the blessing to Jacob, and he wins, right? He comes out, yet again, he comes out on top. Except Jacob and Rebecca, they didn't really consider the aftermath of this situation. They didn't really consider what this would do to Isaac and to Esau. They didn't consider how it would crush them. Isaac was tricked out of being able to bless his firstborn son. And that was a huge deal for that culture. Esau, who had already been conned out of his birthright, now he was left with nothing. But honestly, none of that really mattered to Jacob. Because again, Jacob's mindset was, 
the only person that's going to look out for me is me. He came out on top. He got what he wanted. And you know what? He did it all on his own. He got it without having to trust a single person, or so he thought. You see, when we're in this kind of pain, when we're in the mindset that we can't trust anyone but ourselves, all that matters to us is ourselves. Our number one priority is me, myself, and I. Our number one priority is making sure that I'm taken care of. And if we let it, it'll progress us to becoming apathetic, that is to not caring what happens to other people. Jacob, he didn't care how his choices would affect the people around him. He only wanted to get what he felt like he deserved. Only this time, at the end of the day, it wouldn't go his way. This time, his brother Esau, in his own pain, would make some pretty rash decisions. Decisions out of pain, decisions out of anger. Esau wanted Jacob dead. So as a result of that, Jacob... He decides that the only way out of this is to run away. You know, as I said a little bit ago, in my opinion, disappointment is one of the worst pains that we can experience. That feeling of like placing your trust in someone and in return they take that trust and it just feels like it goes straight into the garbage can. That's what it feels like when we're let down. Jacob's disappointment, it caused him to have to run away. Everything he had gained during the cycle of pain, it was all for nothing. He ran without the birthright that he conned out of Esau. The, the blessing that was just spoken over him by his father would quickly turn to curses. And he found himself in this unknown land, basically starting his life over. And in the meantime, this cycle, it would keep going and going and going. Everyone he trusted would let him down. Even after he ran away, he would be let down by, by his father-in-law, Laban, right? He would be let down by his love, Rachel. No, no matter what he did, it seems like he would be disappointed. So instead of trying to repair his relationships, he adopted this mindset of, well, I might as well get what I can out of it, just like he always had. He bared down on it. He became what he was prophesied to become, this, this trickster, right? This deceiver, this con man. Until one moment. Until he was able to have one moment with God. The quick version is this. After, after Jacob finished his deal with Laban, after he had worked a total of 14 years. And a few more afterwards, he, he decides that he wants to go home. He was tired of living in Laban's camp. He had decided to, to go home. There was a problem, though. The last he knew, his brother Esau, he still wanted him dead. He still wanted him dead after what he had done all those years ago, his past, that he was so desperately trying to run away from. The only way he could go home was to face it head on. So they're on their way back to Jacob's childhood home. And they've, they've, after they're making their way, they, we find this moment where Jacob, he sends his wives away and, and he's alone in his camp. And it says this in Genesis 32, verses 23 through 29. It says that night, Jacob got up took his two wives, his two female servants, and his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he had sent them across the stream, he sent over all of his possessions. So Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man, then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. The man asked him, what is your name, Jacob? He answered. Then the man said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. Jacob said, please tell me your name. But he replied, why do you ask my name? Then he blessed him there. 
So in his struggle, in his pain, in his anxiety, Jacob, he finds himself alone in his camp. He's processing things. He's going over what's about to happen. For all he knew, he was marching to his death. And it's in these struggles that we're told, Jacob, he finds himself in a pretty weird situation. That this dude just shows up and starts wrestling him. Let me ask, do you hate it when that happens? You're just sitting there watching TV. A dude busts in and starts wrestling you. Am I alone? Okay. But little did he know the man that he was wrestling with. It wasn't a man at all, but it was actually God. And in this wrestling match, Jacob, he pushed out all of his frustrations, all of his disappointments, all of his anger and tears and pain. You see, when we're in these types of cycles of pain, it's really easy to lose focus on what matters. Because when we get to this point, all we we want is for this pain to end. And when we try to do it on our own, most times, instead of making the pain better, we're actually, we're actually making it worse. We get so numb. We get so blind to the things going on all around us that sometimes it takes a wrestling match to snap us out of it. It takes us letting go, us letting go of all the bitterness, the anger, the resentment, the disappointment, us letting go of the pain, letting it all flow, letting it all loose on the one person who will never let us down, the one who will never betray us, the one who will always be there regardless of our feelings, regardless of our circumstances, regardless of our issues. And my friends, that is God. It took Jacob wrestling, literally duking it out with the creator of the universe himself for him to realize that while people will let him down, God never will. That while people will fail him, God never will. That while people will hurt him, God never will. And I think that there are people here in this place today that need to hear that. You may have been hurt by somebody you trusted. And I am so sorry for that. I really am. I am sorry that when you put your trust in someone, if they treated it like literal garbage, I am so sorry that you had to go through that. But I want you to know today is that while people will let you down, God never will. So if you're here today, and maybe, I don't know, maybe you're in the throes of disappointment. Maybe you're, you're in the midst of this cycle of pain that is fueled by, by a chronic disappointment. Maybe you've been let down so many times, you're thinking to yourself, man, why, why should I even bother anymore? If that's you today, I want to, I want to encourage you this morning. I want to encourage you to have a moment with God. I want to suggest that you have a moment to throw down with God. And I don't say that as like a disrespectful thing. I really don't. But maybe, maybe you need to begin to take out all of that frustration. Maybe you need to begin to take out all of that anger and that disappointment on the one person that can honestly take it in stride. Maybe you need to wrestle with God today. We're going to do something a little bit different this morning. We're going to close our service this morning with Pastor Cody leading us in one final time of worship. And as he does, my hope and my prayer is that we can, we can make some room in this place for some divine wrestling matches. My hope is that we can begin to drop our guard and that we can enter into God's presence. We can have a moment with him. And and as we do, if you have something going on, if you have a, a need or a circumstance in your life, I want to pray with you. Because I believe that if we take that first step, I believe that God will meet us in the middle. I do. He might meet us just like he met Jacob. So prepare to wrestle a little bit. But I think when we draw near to him, just like his word tells us, he will draw near to us. Amen. 
was good, friends. Thank you so much for checking out today's message. I sincerely hope God was able to meet you where you're at and speak into your life in a new way today. If you want to connect with us, click on the connect link in the description. Whether you need prayer or if you just want someone to talk to, we'd love to reach out. If you want to support the ministry financially, click on the give link in the description. Every dollar goes to continuing the movement started by Jesus himself over 2,000 years ago. Lastly, if you want to hang out with us in person, we gather every week on Sundays at 11 a.m. Hope you all have a great week. We'll catch you next time.